Chapter 18 To Brethren Assembled at General Conference A Call to a Deeper Study of the Word Minneapolis, Minnesota, November 1888 Dear Brethren Assembled at General Conference I entreat you to exercise the spirit of Christians. Do not let strong feelings of prejudice arise, for we should be prepared to investigate the Scriptures with unbiased minds, with reverence and candor. It becomes us to pray over matters of difference in views of Scripture. Personal feelings should not be allowed to influence our words or our judgment. It will grieve the Spirit of God if you close your understanding to the light which God sends you. Dr. Wagner has spoken to us in a straightforward manner. There is precious light in what he has said. Some things presented in reference to the law in Galatians, if I fully understand his position, do not harmonize with the understanding I have had of this subject, but truth will lose nothing by investigation. Therefore I plead for Christ's sake that you come to the living oracles, and with prayer and humiliation seek God. Everyone should feel that he has the privilege of searching the Scriptures for himself, and he should do this with earnest prayer that God will give him a right understanding of his word, and that he may know from positive evidence that he does know what is truth. I would have humility of mind and be willing to be instructed as a child. The Lord has been pleased to give me great light, yet I know that he leads other minds and opens to them the mysteries of his word, and I want to receive every ray of light that God shall send me, though it should come through the humblest of his servants. Of one thing I am certain, as Christians you have no right to entertain feelings of enmity, unkindness, and prejudice toward Dr. Wagner, who has presented his views in a plain, straightforward manner, as a Christian should. If he is in error, you should, in a calm, rational, Christ-like manner, seek to show him from the Word of God where he is out of harmony with its teachings. If you cannot do this, you have no right as Christians to pick flaws, to criticize, to work in the dark, to prejudice minds with your objections. This is Satan's way of working. Some interpretations of Scripture given by Dr. Wagner I do not regard as correct, but I believe him to be perfectly honest in his views, and I would respect his feelings and treat him as a Christian gentleman. I have no reason to think that he is not as much esteemed of God as are any of my brethren, and I shall regard him as a Christian brother so long as there is no evidence that he is unworthy. The fact that he honestly holds some views of Scripture differing from yours or mine is no reason why we should treat him as an offender or as a dangerous man and make him the subject of unjust criticism. We should not raise a voice of censor against him or his teachings unless we can present weighty reasons for so doing and show him that he is in error. No one should feel at liberty to give loose rein to the combative spirit. There are some who desire to have a decision made at once as to what is the correct view on the point under discussion. As this would please Elder B., it is advised that this question be settled at once. But are minds prepared for such a decision? I could not sanction this course because our brethren are exercised by a spirit which moves their feelings and stirs their impulses so as to control their judgment. While under so much excitement as now exists, they are not prepared to make safe decisions. I know it would be dangerous to denounce Dr. Wagner's position as wholly erroneous. This would please the enemy. I see the beauty of truth in the presentation of the righteousness of Christ in relation to the law as the doctor has placed it before us. You say, many of you, it is light in truth, yet you have not presented it in this light heretofore. Is it not possible that through earnest, prayerful searching of the Scriptures he has seen still greater light on some points? That which has been presented harmonizes perfectly with the light which God has been pleased to give me during all the years of my experience. If our ministering brethren would accept the doctrine which has been presented so clearly, the righteousness of Christ in connection with the law, and I know they need to accept this, their prejudices would not have a controlling power, and the people would be fed with their portion of meat in due season. Let us take our Bibles, and with humble prayer and a teachable spirit, 
Come to the great teacher of the world. Let us pray as did David, Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Psalm 119, verse 18. I see no excuse for the wrought-up state of feeling that has been created at this meeting. This is the first time I have had opportunity to listen to anything in reference to this subject. I have had no conversation in regard to it with my son, W. C. White, with Dr. Wagner, or with Elder A. T. Jones. At this meeting I have heard for the first time Dr. Wagner's reasons for his position. The messages coming from your president at Battle Creek are calculated to stir you up to make hasty decisions and to take decided positions, but I warn you against doing this. You are not now calm. There are many who do not know what they believe. It is perilous to make decisions upon any controverted point without dispassionately considering all sides of the question. Excited feelings will lead to rash movements. It is certain that many have come to this meeting with false impressions and perverted opinions. They have imaginings that have no foundation in truth. Even if the position which we have held upon the two laws is truth, the spirit of truth will not countenance any such measures to defend it as many of you would take. The spirit that attends the truth should be such as will represent the author of truth. Says the Apostle James, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you, let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. James 3, verses 13 to 18. The truth must be presented as it is in Jesus, if there are any among us who become stirred up because ideas contrary from what have been believed are presented in this meeting, then stop your unsanctified criticisms and candidly investigate the subject, and it will sanctify the soul. Two years ago, while in Switzerland, I was addressed in the night season by a voice which said, Follow me. I thought I arose and followed my guide. I seemed to be in the tabernacle at Battle Creek and my guide gave instructions in regard to many things at the conference. I will give in substance a few things that were said. The Spirit of God has not had a controlling influence in this meeting. The Spirit that controlled the Pharisees is coming in among this people who have been greatly favored of God. Many things were spoken which I will not now present to you. I was told that there was need of great spiritual revival among the men who bear responsibilities in the cause of God. There was not perfection in all points on either side of the question under discussion. We must search the scriptures for evidences of truth. There are but few, even of those who claim to believe it, that comprehend the third angel's message, and yet this is the message for this time. It is present truth. But how few take up this message in its true bearing and present it to the people in its power. With many it has but little force. Said my guide, there is much light yet to shine forth from the law of God and the gospel of righteousness. This message, understood in its true character and proclaimed in the Spirit, will lighten the earth with its glory. The great decisive question is to be brought before all nations, tongues, and peoples. The closing work of the third angel's message will be attended with a power that will send rays of the sun of righteousness into all the highways and byways of life, and decisions will be made for God as supreme governor. His law will be looked upon as the rule of his government. Many who claim to believe the truth will change their opinions in times of peril, and will take the side of the transgressors of God's law in order to escape persecution. There will be great humbling of hearts before God on the part of everyone who remains faithful and true to the end. 
But Satan will so work upon the unconsecrated elements of the human mind that many will not accept the light in God's appointed way. I entreat you, brethren, be not like the Pharisees, who are blinded with spiritual pride, self-righteousness, and self-sufficiency, who because of this were forsaken of God. For years I have been receiving instructions and warnings that this was the danger to our people. Says the Scripture, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. John 12, verses 42 and 43. There is positive danger that some who profess to believe the truth will be found in a position similar to that of the Jews. They take the ideas of the men they are associated with not because by searching the scriptures they conscientiously accept the teachings and the doctrine as truth. I entreat you to make God your trust. Idolize no man. Depend upon no man. Let not your love of man hold them in places of trust that they are not qualified to fill to the glory of God. For man is finite and erring, liable to be controlled by his own opinions and feelings. Self-esteem and self-righteousness are coming in upon us, and many will fall because of unbelief and unrighteousness, for the grace of Christ is not ruling in the hearts of many. We are to be ever searching for the truth as for hidden treasures. I entreat you, close not the door of the heart, for fear some ray of light shall come to you. You need greater light. You need a clearer understanding of the truth which you carry to the people. If you do not see light yourselves, you will close the door. If you can, you will prevent the rays of light from coming to the people. Let it not be said of this highly favored people, You entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in you hindered. Luke 11, verse 52. All these lessons are given for the benefit of those upon whom the ends of the world are come. I have been shown that Jesus will reveal to us precious old truths in a new light, if we are ready to receive them but they must be received in the very way in which the Lord shall choose to send them. With humble, softened hearts, with respect and love for one another, search your Bibles. The light may not come in accordance with plans that men may devise, but all who reverence the Word of God just as it reads, all who do His will to the best of their ability, will know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, notwithstanding the efforts of the enemy to confuse minds and to make uncertain the Word of God. God calls every man's attention to his living oracles. Let no one quench the Spirit of God by resting the Scriptures, by putting human interpretations upon his inspired word, and let no one pursue an unfair course, keep in the dark, not willing to open their ears to hear, and yet free to comment and quibble and sow their doubts of that which they will not candidly take time to hear. Let men be careful how they handle the word of inspiration, which has been preserved for ages through the power of God. If men were themselves controlled by the Holy Spirit, they would bring heart and soul to the task, searching and digging in the minds of God for precious ore. They would be eager to come into harmony with the writings of inspired men. If they are not controlled by the Spirit of God, they will give evidence of this by caviling over His Word and by sitting in judgment upon its teachings, just as did the Jews. We should guard against the influence of men who have trained themselves as debaters, for they are in continual danger of handling the Word of God deceitfully. There are men in our churches all through the land who will pervert the meaning of the Scripture to make a sharp point and overcome an opponent. They do not reverence the sacred word. They put their own construction upon its utterances. Christ is not formed within the hope of glory. They are educated critics, but spiritual truths can only be spiritually discerned. These men are ever ready and equipped to oppose at a moment's notice anything that is contrary to their own opinions. They handle the scriptures in an unwise way and bring self into everything they do. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. 
and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. 2 Timothy 2, verses 24-26 to The servant of the Lord must not strive, but must teach the word of God in the manner that God has ordained. Any other way is not God's way and will create confusion. Brother Morrison is a debater. He is a man who has not had a daily living experience in the meekness and lowliness of Christ. He is in danger of making false issues and of treating them as realities. He will create strife and the result will be dissensions and bickerings. He has many things to overcome, and if he fails to overcome them, he will make shipwreck of faith, as did Elder Canwright. It is dangerous to cherish feelings of self-sufficiency. He must have the meekness of Christ, the sanctifying power of the truth must be brought into the sanctuary of his soul. Then he will be a polished instrument in the hands of God to do his work. It is a matter of deep concern to us whether or not we are perfecting a Christian character, growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we are daily learners in the school of Christ, we shall be daily obtaining an experience in Christian life, and we shall not be self-sufficient and self-exalted. We shall be as humble as little children, and there will be a nourishing power in our words which will drop as the dew. The fruits of righteousness sown in peace of them that make peace, will then appear. Growth in grace will give Brother Morrison increased ability to comprehend the deep mysteries of the gospel. Those who are in so great a degree unacquainted with Christ are ignorant of the spirit they cherish. They will be dry and Christless. The knowledge of Christ and His Word is the foundation and fullness of all knowledge. Many workers are not now fitted for the position of trust they occupy. They must be transformed by the grace of Christ. God wants to give our brethren another spirit. Without this change, they will carry the spirit of irreverence for God and His living oracles into their work, and if this mold is put upon the work, it will dishonor God. The subduing, softening influence of the grace of Christ must fashion and mold character. Then it will be a pleasure to deal justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God. The debating spirit has come into the ranks of Sabbath keepers to take the place of the Spirit of God. They have placed finite men where God should be, but nothing can suffice for us but to have Christ dwell in our hearts by faith. The truth must become ours. Christ must be our Savior by an experimental knowledge. We should know by faith what it is to have our sins pardoned and to be born again. We must have a higher, deeper wisdom than man's to guide us amid the perils surrounding our pathway. The Spirit of Christ must be in us just as the blood is in the body, circulating through it as a vitalizing power. Our greatest fear should be that we may be found rebelling against God's Word, which is to be our guide amid all the perils of the last days. We must be sure that we are on the Lord's side, that we have the truth as it is in Jesus. With the grace of God in the soul, we may be secure anywhere, strong in the Lord, and in the power of His might. We would discourage the discipline that tends to make persons debaters. We urge you not to connect young men who are learning to be teachers of Bible truth with one who has a debating spirit, for they will surely receive the wrong mold of character. The habitual debater is so accustomed to be clouding and turning aside evidence, and even the scriptures from the true meaning to win his point, that everything that does not strike him favorably and is not in harmony with his ideas he will combat, caviling at God's inspired word. There is too little dependence upon God. When God would have a special work done for the advancement of the truth, he will impress men to work in the minds of truth with prayerful earnestness to discover the precious ore. These men will have Christ-like perseverance. They will not fail to be discouraged. They will sink self out of sight in Jesus. Men will go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way for the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is their work to make crooked things straight. Some things must be torn down. Some things must be built up. The old treasures must be reset in a framework of truth. 
They are to preach God's word. Their testimony must not be molded by the opinions and ideas that have been regarded as sound, but by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. They are to lift up Christ and call sinners to repentance. They are to practice the graces of Christ, to pursue a straightforward course, breaking down skepticism and urging upon all their personal responsibility to be kind and courteous, to do good, and to win souls to Jesus. The Scripture should not be treated in a debating style. Those who have educated themselves as debaters have so increased their spirit of combativeness that they are ready to cavil over the Word of God, to resist and oppose everything that disagrees with their ideas or opinions. They are in their element when an opportunity is offered for them to question and criticize, for it is natural for them to be ready for battle at any time. They will play upon words, misinterpret, and misstate, because this has become a settled habit with them, a second nature. Nothing is safe in their hands. Now the Lord desires that those who are in this condition should be converted, that they become as little children, simple, meek, teachable, and Christ-like. We must have the power of God to soften and change the rugged traits of our character, that we may be susceptible to the influence of truth. We should look upon the Word of God with reverence, as something sacred. Christ is true, and without Him we know nothing as we ought to know it. We are lacking in the spirituality of true religion. When the Jews took the first step in the rejection of Christ, they took a dangerous step. When afterward evidence accumulated that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, they were too proud to acknowledge that they had erred. So with the people of our day who reject the truth. They do not take time to investigate candidly, with earnest prayer, the evidences of the truth, and they oppose that which they do not understand. Just like the Jews, they take it for granted they have all the truth, and feel a sort of contempt for anyone who should suppose they had more correct ideas than themselves of what is truth. All the evidence produced they decide shall not weigh a straw with them, and they tell others that the doctrine is not true, and afterward, when they see as light evidence they were so forward to condemn, they have too much pride to say, I was wrong. They still cherish doubt and unbelief, and are too proud to acknowledge their convictions. Because of this, they take steps that lead to results of which they have never dreamed. Those who have not been in the habit of thinking and investigating for themselves believe certain doctrines because their associates with them in the work believe them. They resist the truth without going to the scriptures for themselves to learn what is truth. Because those in whom they have had confidence oppose the light, they oppose it, not knowing they are rejecting the counsel of God against themselves. God has a work to do in our world that many finite minds do not see or understand. And when God unfolds truth to his people— and it does not come in harmony with their ideas, many are ready to despise and reject it. I entreat you, brethren, reverence your Bible. Plead with God for light. Fast and pray in your closet upon your knees. Ask God to lead you into all truth. Tell him that you want the truth as it is in Jesus. It is not wise for one of these young men to commit himself to a decision at this meeting where opposition rather than investigation is the order of the day. The scriptures must be your study. Then you will know that you have the truth. Open your heart that God may write the truth upon its tablets. One who would be a teacher of sacred things should not go forth to work with the people without a full assurance that he has the truth. He should not go forth feeling that perhaps the doctrines which he advocates may not all be substantiated by the Bible. Anything short of a full conviction that what he presents is truth will make his preaching powerless, unless he has the presumption to put forth mere assertions as conclusive evidence. This is unfair, and yet this has often been done by sharp debaters. You should give your authority to the people from God's word. You should not believe any doctrine simply because another says it is truth. You should not believe it because Elder Smith or Elder Kilgore 
or Elder Van Horn or Elder Haskell says its truth, but because God's voice has declared it in his living oracles. Truth will triumph gloriously, and those who have received the truth because God has revealed it in his word will triumph with it. Those who neglect to search for evidence for themselves and rely upon what someone else says will not have root in themselves and will not be able to give a reason of the hope that is within them. God's commands must be heard. He says, Go forward. There are large fields to be explored. There are mines to be discovered in which are precious jewels of truth. Let no one close these mines and cease to dig for the truth, lest they should have to cast aside some preconceived idea or opinion. No, brethren, we want to know the truth, and God forbid that any of you should turn from precious truths simply because you do not want to believe them. No one must be permitted to close the avenues whereby the light of truth shall come to the people. As soon as this shall be attempted, God's Spirit will be quenched. For that Spirit is constantly at work to give fresh and increased light to His people through His Word. Let the love of Christ reign in hearts here. Let all yield themselves to that heavenly power which alone can create unity by quelling selfish ambitions and human pride. When the Spirit of God comes in, love will take the place of variance, because Jesus is love. If His Spirit were cherished here, our meeting would be like a stream in the desert. Has the truth as it is in Jesus been received into the heart? Have the mind of God and His ways become our mind and our ways? Is the law of God our standard? If it is, its principles will be wrought out in our life. Wherever the love of Jesus reigns, there is peace with God, joy in God, and the love and joy are reflected to others. We cannot afford to be deceived by a semblance, a form. The truth of the Bible may be read, and we may think that a form of words will accomplish that which only the Spirit of God can accomplish by its converting, transforming power. We may hold certain points of truth firmly, and yet refuse to let in any fresh rays of light which God may send to show us the beauty of the truth. It is dangerous for us to take a step in uncertainty. We should not reject or oppose the views of our fellow laborers, because they do not agree with our ideas, until we have used every means in our power to find out whether or not they are truth, comparing Scripture with Scripture. If we do otherwise, a combative spirit will arise at the first approach of anything that differs from our views. We may be led on by the enemy to take a position against the truth, because it does not come in a way to suit us, and in the spirit of the deceived Jews we shall resist the light which God sends, and that light, instead of being the blessing which heaven meant it to be to us, to advance us in spirituality and in the knowledge of God, will become a stumbling block over which we shall be constantly falling. We shall become irritated and indignant, for enmity is in our heart against God's truth. If evidence is afterwards presented from the Scriptures, it will not be received by him who has rejected light. The men of Nazareth opened their hearts to unbelief, and as the result they rejected Christ. The combative spirit will rise against the truth and unfair means will be taken to influence others and to make it of none effect. The Lord would have our intellect sanctified, elevated, ennobled, that we may distinguish truth from error and bring the truth into the soul temple, that it may exercise an influence upon our spirit and character. The most terrible thing that could come to us as people is the fatal deception that was the ruin of Chorazin and Bethsaida. They had great light, great privileges and blessings. Jesus was with them, but they did not appreciate or receive the light he gave them. They were not made better by it. I would warn all my ministering brethren, and especially the young, never to touch an infidel book, never to present infidel cavils. Some have thought it essential to understand these that they might know how to meet objectors. In our college, debaters have been educated by considering objections to the Bible. 
This has sometimes been done by our students for the purpose of bringing the light of truth in contrast with infidel arguments. In times when the soul is under temptation, Satan causes the seeds of doubt that are thus sown to germinate, and they blossom into fruit. Discipline of this order is a dangerous discipline for our students. Never give the least sanction to the presentation of infidel arguments. Turn from them as you would from a serpent, for there is concealed in them a sting that would wound the soul. Principles and practices must be strictly guarded. Habits are formed by training the mind in a certain course of action. What we do once, we do more readily the second time, and we learn to pursue a certain course by force of habit. If we are trained to cavil, we shall be trained to doubt and uncertainty. When Jesus is not abiding in the soul, the natural tendency to doubt, question, and criticize will extend to God's word as well as to the testimonies, and the habit of caviling will ruin the soul. In place of godly fear and holy reverence in handling the scriptures, there will be a forward, bold assumption, a proud, boasting spirit that loves to strive, and the most sacred things will be lightly regarded, the most sacred feelings will be trampled upon. God has but little to do with such workers. We are to hold fast every jot and tittle of the truth revealed to us in the living oracles. But we are not to think that we now have a knowledge of all the truth that there is for us. We may well ask whither we are drifting. Even the inspiration of the scriptures has been under the judgment of finite man, and they have dealt with the oracles of God in the same manner as they have with the testimonies of the Spirit of God, cutting and carving them at will as it pleased them, and in so doing make them of none effect. Those who do this know not what they are doing. Unless there is most earnest seeking of the Lord, unless there is zealous work of repentance, darkness will come upon minds, and the darkness will be in proportion to the light which has not been appreciated. Unless there is less of self and far more of the Holy Spirit to take control of the minds and hearts of men who have stood in the foremost rank, there will be a failure on their part to walk out in harmony with the opening providences of God. They will question and quibble over any light that the Lord may send, and will turn away from the teachings of Christ, confiding in themselves and trusting in their supposed knowledge of what is truth. As the Jews refuse the light of the world, so many of those who claim to believe the present truth will refuse light which the Lord will send to his people. In brackets it says, Revelation 3, verses 14 to 21, quoted. Shall its solemn warnings have no weight with us? Never let Satan have the control of your powers. As a people, we need humility. In this conference, we are sowing seeds that will yield a harvest, and the results will be as enduring as eternity. Young workers are watching to see what spirit you manifest in this meeting, and how you treat those who hold views that differ from yours. You know that precious light has shone forth in connection with the law of God, as the righteousness of Christ has been presented with that law. Dr. Wagner has opened to you precious light, not new, but old light, which has been lost sight of by many minds, and is now shining forth in clear rays. Let a spirit of fairness come in. Though you think his ideas upon this subject may not be all sound, do not make false statements. Do not mistake his words. Place him in no false light. Maintain the Spirit of Christ. Keep the commandments of God. Love God supremely and your neighbor as yourself. God's law reads, Thou shalt not bear false witness. I hope none will go from this meeting repeating the false statements that have been circulated here or carrying with them the spirit which has been here manifested. It has not been of Christ. It has come from another source. All who have the truth can afford to be fair. See to it, my brethren, that words coming from finite man are not received as the voice of God. We want to be Christians. We should pray and study our Bibles more. 
Nothing is safe that does not bear the credentials of heaven. Let God be true and every man a liar. His word is infinite, and every man will find that it is sure and steadfast forever.